You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. This is your host, Ken Lane, talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona. And it has just been a glorious week. This is why we send pictures back to family and friends in Minnesota, Illinois, Michigan, uh, of our of our thermometers. <laughs> They're buried in snow. And we're out in uh, light jackets, if any jacket, washing the car, just uh, enjoying the mountains of Arizona. It's been great. And so we are into, I've gotten a lot of gardening done or, or cleanup this week in my own, in the Lane House. And so this is at my own house, also here at the Garden Center. But, but uh, basically, it's a great time to be cutting back those perennials, your, your summer blooming shrubs, fruit trees, and the like. I thought I would just go over some of the things. And, and what I do, this is how I come up with the writing schedule or uh, what to talk about on the radio show. It's whatever I'm doing in my own yards, that's what you get. Whatever's it's top of mind, you get to share it. So at least it's seasonal. It's going to be timely because this is what, you know, my name's Ken and I'm, I, we're just friends and we're talking over the fence in the backyard just as neighbors. And here's what's going, here's what's working in my own backyard. And so this is probably for anyone in the mountains of Arizona. I would say that once you head up the hill from Black Canyon City and you're coming up I-17, all of us are, are very similar, whether it's the White Mountains, Flagstaff, Heber, Payson, Kingman, Sedona, Cottonwood, Prescott, Prescott Valley, Cordes Junction, we're all high elevation. Once you come up that hill, it's God's country. Yes, we may be a little bit different by a couple of weeks. I mean, uh, I was mentioning last week the frost dates. What's the last frost date for Prescott in this central highland area? And it was Mother's Day. That's what the local gardeners use. That's the holiday that they use to mark, okay, now it's time to plant my summer vegetables, my summer blooming plants, my summer flowers. Uh, before that, you're planting your spring and late winter flowers. These are your pansies and lilacs and forsythias and fruit trees. They love to be planted now. Whereas uh, a tomato plant would despise everything about now through April. They just, it doesn't like the chilliness. They like warm, hot. They like the soil to be warm, much less the, the surrounding air to be chilly and frosty. So we'd mentioned that. So we're at, at Mother's Day. Really, there's only about two, three weeks difference between us, 5,000 foot level and Flagstaff, Pine Top Lakeside, the, the, the White Mountains area, the, the 7,000 foot level. They're at Memorial Day. Basically, it all falls in May, last frost. It's just a few weeks difference. And so maybe if you're in Kingman or you're tuning in from Cottonwood or Camp Verde, Sedona, you might be the end of April. Just a, just a couple weeks before Mother's Day. But basically, we're all very, very similar. Uh, our water, our wind, our soil, they're very alkaline. It's windy. It's just we have very similar uh, variables. This week, I was pruning back my butterfly bush and salvias or autumn sages, some Russian sage. These are all summer blooming things. They're hardcore dormant. They have no foliage. So it's a great time to clean those things up. It, and you can see where you're pruning because you can see the structure of the plant. Here's an insider tip. or This is something that I was doing myself in, in my own garden. I'm going, ooh, ooh, I should share this. So I, I think this is something you could describe over the airwaves. People could grasp it and pick it up. All of, the, all of your blooming plants, I don't care whether it's a rose, a lilac, a forsythia, a, a crepe myrtle, uh, uh, any of these kinds of blooming plants, they put more energy in tender new young stems or branches than they do old, crusty, thick, uh, gnarly branches. So as I'm trying to cut back, clean up, and thin out these shrubs, could be a head high forsythia, it could be a, a hip high Russian sage or, or, or salvia, or any or coreopsis, any anything anything in between. 
what I'm looking for before I even start. I'm looking at it going, okay, I want to thin out some of these old canes, old branches, old stems. So I'll take the loppers or the hand pruners, and I just purposely go after the biggest, biggest trunks. And what I want to be left with are young, vibrant, tender, soft, uh, flexible branches. Those are the ones that will bloom better for me as they come into their bloom cycle. And so I purposely start with those. And as soon as I pull out just two or three of those big, gnarly branches, going, they've been in there way too long. And as soon as I pull those out, it opens up the structure of the plant so I know where to prune. Now I can just open it up. Or the next thing I do is anything that's laying on the ground, they're growing not up and, and upright going, look at me, I'm going to bloom. These, these, some of, some of the branches go, I just want to be, I want to be underground. Don't look at me. I'm not a rock star. I'm not worthy. If they're going into the ground and they're, they're trying to hide under the branch, I'm cutting you out of there. I want all of the energy from the roots to go up into these vibrant, upright structures that are on tender new canes. So I just, I just uh, pruned back my uh, autumn sage. I had some big canes that were, gosh, like a like a broomstick, too big. When I got back, it was it was hip high by hip wide. When I got back, it was two foot high by two foot wide. Everything was growing straight up, and all I had left were pencil size branches coming up erect from from the structure of that soil. This plant, when I fertilize it in a few weeks, when I'm all done with with uh, pruning, I'll fertilize everything. And it will just come out with a vengeance. I mean, it will load up with so many buds and it will never stop blooming. It will just bloom repeatedly over and over. Did the exact same thing with my Russian sage. This is a a blue blooming, uh, kind of lavender blooming shrub about hip high. It grows too wide. It's too aggressive sometimes. You've got to really whack on this thing. Or it tends to run and reseed and come up all over the place. So I'm pretty aggressive with my Russian sage. And so I, perp- I go after the biggest trunks. Anything that's got bark on it, I'm going, that's, that's, you've been in there too long. I'll thin those out, open it up, and then I go, okay, I'm too tall. I want to be down about knee high, whack them off. Anything growing off to the sides, bring them back. So all I have are erect, upright, vase-shaped, tender branches that are pencil shape, uh, pencil size or, or smaller. It really simplifies the pruning of your shrubs, at least, if you look at it in the, that perspective. So I don't start by taking it back uh, from the height I want. I start by looking for the big, aggressive branches to thin it down. And, and you're fine. Prune now. The days are so nice. You've got now through middle of March, end of March. Really, you should be done by the end of March, if you're creeping into April, uh, you're starting to get too late. I think there's no real pressure. And, and what I do is I'll take a few beds at a time. Each, really what I'm doing, trash pickup was on Monday of this last week at, at our house on our street. And so I try to fill it up Sunday and Monday morning. So it's just, I'm just, just and I'm just trying to get enough to fill those up. All my grape vines were pruned back this week. So I got it done and, and grapes can be wild and woolly. They just have branches going everywhere. I cut everything off of those grapes except for it was at head height. I've got one main trunk coming up to a six foot feeder cedar fence. And the reason it's six foot is because that's what the code allows. The reason the grapevine is going to six foot because that's how tall the fence is. I know the book says wineries do it this way. Well, my backyard's not a winery and I don't want it to be. I want it to be uh, like my my cedar fence. I just want to soften it. And so I want my vines to grow up to the top. And then I have a T-shaped vine that comes off and goes on down either side of that cedar fence. I'll fertilize when I'm all done uh, pruning into February. I've got another couple, two, three weeks or so. Through March, I'll, I'll just fertilize everything after that. And it will just come out. As soon as that soil is warming up, those grapes will just grow. And I will have tremendous production on those very heavy clusters of grapes growing on my vines. It's not exactly the way Google would have you do it by some vintner in in Northern California, but you know what? I think backyard gardeners have more 
flex. I don't have to get an extra bushels of, of grapes coming off my, my grape vines. I want it to be beautiful and functional, not just functional. Anyway, some insider tips got a lot in store for you. Lisa Waters Lane coming in the studio with your garden questions. Be right back. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. Hi, Ken with the Plants of the Week and our majestic giant, Pansies. Mammoth blooms smother this 12-inch plant right through winter. Fragrant like its fairy-faced cousin, this giant bloomer has the perfect balance between evergreen foliage and flower brightness. Hardy and carefree, this local pansy brings the garden back to life, all for just $5.99. You'll only find them at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love majestic pansies, they love to shop. Let's talk poop. Hey, I'm Tommy at Waters Garden Center. Ken and Lisa are out right now, so I snuck in to remind you that it's time to add some manure to your garden. It's been a wet winter, and your soil is, well, pooped. Waters Barnyard Manure adds nutrients to get your garden growing. It's organic and odorless, so we really can say our poop don't stink. Buy six bags or more. They're only $5.99. Now that's a load of crap. Tommy, what's going on? Oh, poop, gotta go. Natural, safe, odorless, and organic at Waters Garden Center. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And in the studio is Lisa Waters Lane. She brings your garden questions to you. Just you can hang out and, and hear what every, other gardeners are talking about. What are they asking? And so Lisa brings those to us. It's from a multitude of sources and mm-hmm. growing. It's almost frightening. <laughs> The amount of Facebook and Twitter and Pinstagram and 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 Pinstagram, pin, <laughs> Instagram, <laughs> Pinterest. I just I'm starting to combine them. <laughs> You're talking about Pinstamans, <laughs> Pinstagram. Well, yeah, <laughs> that too. They're starting to come up. So Lisa brings those to us. In fact, we are just back from mm-hmm. Tucson, yes. the uh, INA Independent Nurseries of Arizona. Uh, it's the biggest garden center of each each city throughout the state. We kind of formed our own co-op, and so we meet together twice a year. In the winter, it's in in the deserts, and the in the summer, it's up here in in the mountains. And so we were down learning from the Masta. <laughs> Different. We've got a buddy of ours, Mesquite Valley Growers, Tom and Kathy Bishop. They just built a glorious, beautiful new garden center in Tucson. Mm-hmm. And Tom was kind enough to give us the inside scoop. This is his legacy. He's given us his vision, Mm -hmm. where he got this, where he came from, where he wants to take it. And you only get that when you're friends with a fellow business owner. Otherwise, you just skirt it and go, oh, yeah, everything's good. (laughs) No, we get the inside of how hard it was to get the permits and how the city was to deal with. And and just just, it's it's great to have that. And then we took our team down with us. Mm -hmm. And... uh, just they get to see some of that too. It's a bonding thing. So you go ride horses with the gals. Yeah. I have no interest, but uh, you, you, all the gals love. We've got some uh-huh. horse folks here, and so right. it's fun to to go Stayed down. And fun at to be a back. Nice resort. I know I'm going to mess up the name. Tank 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 of Verde. Tank of Verde. Yeah, I always wanted to call it something else, but beautiful. Yeah, yeah very lovely. Dude Ranch. Ex- Extraordinaire, mm-hmm. kind of a perk for the team. And then, since I'm president of the group this year, I'm going. No, I want to stay at a nice place. <laughs> and so we're, we lined up kind of the best place we could find during the Tucson Gym Show. It's like Aye. it's packed down there. Yes, it There's is. Bodies everywhere. And so this is uh, good. Good to be a part of that. Mm-hmm. Tucson's pretty this time of year. Oh, it's perfect. Eighty degrees, the poolside. Oh, it's nice. So, garden questions. Yeah. Uh, what do you got for us? Is well, anything going on? Yeah, our first question is from Devin, and it's kind of a a, a multi question question. Oh, I've got twenty <laughs> minutes to speak. Then, okay. Uh, about pre emergent. Okay. Yeah. Question number one: Is it too late to put the pre emergent down yeah. for those okay. spring we spring weeds? Yeah. And second. Um, Wants to know, can you use pre-emergent in a raised bed 
where you put vegetables, not from seed, from start, but can you use it in a bed, raised bed? And is it dangerous to any of your existing trees, shrubs, good, that kind good of Good questions. Stuff? Now, pre-emergent and, and weed killers, what's the difference? We should just go over that for Devin just so they know. Mm-hmm. A weed killer is it's coming up. You spray the foliage. It absorbs that poison, takes it through the structure of the plant, and kills it root and all. That's Let's round up. That's what that is. Mm-hmm. A pre-emergent, which is a, it's, it's a usually granular, uh, so you spread it like a fertilizer. It taints the soil, especially when you're doing like crushed granite. You've got rock lawns or flower beds or around trees. We've got weeds coming up through in between the, the shrubs. It, what it does is it taints the soil so that as that seed germinates, it sends off the taproot, it kills the taproot so the plant can never get established, thus the name pre-emergent before it emerges it actually will work on some smaller weeds if you catch it when it's early Mm -hmm. big established trees big established shrubs big established weeds has no effect whatsoever and so you've got to put this down before you have weeds and so yes i think your timing is great perfect well done there's a few things that are starting to come up some dandelions there's a few but we're only getting started Mm -hmm. there's a few things like foxtail coming up but we're only getting started and so i think you want to get it on right away or you will just be overrun the next storm we have any amount of moisture is going to take over the next question you really want to ask is how dangerous is it to birds and dogs and your husband and that kind of stuff Um, what I do is I I like to put it on right before the storms. If I know a storm's coming, I'll put it on. So the rain takes it in the ground. It actually has to be in the ground to really work, not on top. And so if you've got pets, um, take a hose to it, get it in the ground. Then it's not affected. Then it doesn't, doesn't bother it. It's exceptionally good at where that bird feeder is. You've got the Milo coming up. It creates this Mm -hmm. big, big forest underneath your Put it down. It won't. The seed won't germinate underneath that. But you have to do it before the bird seed germinates, not after. It's a good preventative, but it's not a good killer. There, you're actually going to take out. We've got some organic killers that you know, vinegar based, oil based kind of stuff. That's that's highly effective and still organic and safe for birds and pets and that kind of stuff. I would say stay away from Roundup. We're starting to see. That it does cause cancer. We are seeing cases where it is causing cancer. And so you you do want to be careful if you're doing that. Be really careful around the birds. Be exceptionally careful around uh, your pets. And be be sort of careful around your husbands and stuff. So uh, just, just, just be using common sense with mm-hmm. things. But that's kind of how you, how you okay, use pre So his one question you didn't touch on oh. would be using it in a raised vegetable bed i think yes you could do it now if you're doing seed it's Mm -hmm. not going to germinate because it affects the seed but if you're doing a a lettuce plant not even if it doesn't even phase it and so there there might be some better choices there i mean that what i do what we do in our own raised beds is we'll plant and we put a two three inch layer of cedar bark Mm -hmm. to keep the weeds down so the book says two to three inch of cedar cedar repels bugs and then it also prevents weeds from coming up. So you get a you get a multiple fold. And then I don't have to worry about, did I go too far? Did I get too much? Mm-hmm. Uh, so if in doubt, keep it all organic in your raised beds if you're worried about you vegetables. Go. All right. Yeah. Very good explanation there. So Shelly in Prescott Valley was watching the Facebook stream of the wildflowers. Yeah. And she missed a little part of it. She wants to know, what's the difference between soil activator and fertilizer? Oh, well, it's a good question. Okay. So you kind of do both with any kind of seeds. If you're getting your vegetables garden ready, you use both. If you're doing your wildflower, you're doing both. And so fertilizer, we put together an all-purpose plant food. It's a natural food. It's a 744 Main ingredients, cotton seed meal. Um, it's a good, uh, slow-release breakdown. It actually provides nutrients, like steak and potato kind of stuff, for plants. I mean, actual rooted, going plants. Soil activator, if you were to take a compost pile and break it down to its absolute last element, it would be humic acid. Soil activator is humic acid. 
if you want to stimulate the soil, the things in the soil, the, the mycorrhizodes, the, the, the fungi, the, the worms, you want to stimulate things that live in the soil, you give it a soil activator. And all of a sudden, they're, they're burrowing through and they're opening up, and they're aerating the soil. And so when you plant a, a seed or a plant in that, they kind of go, whoa, this soil's alive. My goodness, look what's going on. I, I just, it's got to be good to root here. So one feeds the soil, soil activator, and the other one feeds the plant. They're used at the same time. Uh, you could put them one on it before the other, and it's just fine. Uh, soil activator has no nutritional value. You're fertilizing the, the worms and things in the soil. So you, you aren't going to overdo it. And if you're using organic foods, really, you're not going to overdo it. I had one guy last year. He took the, the, I said, we can't burn with this fertilizer. We make it here. It's for local plants. And he went, went home and he planted in the fertilizer. God, you, you idiot. What you, <laughs> I just wanted to slap him. You're sitting there nodding, smiling, going, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's another plant. Don't do that again. You, it's a food. So there is some heat to it, especially the nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And so you want to use some common sense. Same with fertilizer, with the uh, manures. Sure. You want to use some common sense. You want to cut it. Don't plant right in manure. It's mm -hmm. too hot for your gardens. So that's it for this segment. We are out of time. So we'll be back, though. Uh, Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. Don't change that dial. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. In a new place, it's difficult to know who to trust, how to get help at the house, and which nursery will simply do what they say they'll do. At Waters Garden Center, we're here to help, in the landscape at least. Our team of plant ambassadors know your neighborhood, the plants that add color, increase privacy, and add fragrance and beauty. And we can show you exactly how to plant locally. Or we have teams to do all the work for you. We are Ken and Lisa Lane, and we guarantee our plants will live up to every promise here at Waters Garden Center. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Just before Lisa came into the studio, shared your, your garden questions, I was mentioning pruning, just what I was doing in my own yards. One thing I didn't get to, I should probably elaborate on, is the evergreens. I'm not pruning my hedges back yet. I'm not pruning back my roses yet. Some things I'm purposely holding off on. Uh, and, and here's why. If you go through and, and do a major butcher job on your junipers, Red tip photinia, cotoneaster, euonymus. They're not going to start growing for another month. Usually in March, they start to put on a little leaves. They start to wake up. So if you do major prunes right now, you get to look at that cut, the major branch is coming off with a, with a snip on it for a month. What I purposely do on my hedged evergreens is I'll wait until they're just about to break dormancy. Then I cut them back. There's no right or wrong. This is just for me. This is my thing. Uh, the book says do it anytime you want between New Year's and March, end of March. Now, I, I purposely tweak that because I don't like the look when they're just cut back. They look terrible. And so I've got neighbors going back and forth. I'm out sipping tea, watching hummingbirds, and they're, they're looking butchered. They haven't woken up yet. I'll, I purposely wait on my roses until March because it's healthier for them. So I've not touched any of my roses and I have not touched any of my evergreen hedges yet. Everything else I'm pruning back. Oh, also I have not touched my lilacs, forsythia, quince, azaleas, rhododendrons, things that bloom in early spring. Like I've already got honeysuckle in bloom in my yard. I've already got uh, a winter blooming jasmine in bloom in my yard. They're, they're in bloom, not full bloom, but they're cracking color and I can see flowers exposed on the actual uh, shrub. The lilacs, the buds are ginormous. In another month and a half, they'll be in full glorious bloom. If I go back and prune those right now, it doesn't, doesn't do anything for the health of the plant. It, it's fine. They don't care. But you as the gardener, 
you planted the lilacs and forsythia and quince and azalea. You planted all those early spring bloomers for the flowers. And if you prune them back now, you've cut all the flowers off or most of the flowers. And so usually with the early spring bloomers, we enjoy the flowers first. We prune them back right after, right after they're done blooming. Summer blooming plants like Rosa Sharon's, crepe myrtles, chase trees, there's a whole series, salvias, sages, all those things we prune back now because they have no interest in budding or doing anything right now. They're cold, they're hibernated, and they aren't going to wake up until May. They got two, three more months of, of hibernation before they wake up. Whereas your spring things, they're waking up right now. They're loving this weather. They love everything about bright days and cold nights and, and the first of the hun honeybees coming out and, and migrating hummingbirds. They're trying to capture uh, that that essence, the, the, the spring flow. They're trying to take advantage of that. And so they're starting to bloom or show color now. And it will only get more glorious as we get through the, the end of April. So the next couple months are two, three months are just, it's all about spring and spring bloomers. So just the sequence, when you bloom things, if in doubt, come in and ask us, take an iPad, take a picture going, should I prune this one? And we can, we can tell what it is just by, just by the twigs. I can tell what things are. Any horticulturalist will be able to do the same. Um, your fruit trees, I would say benefit by pruning right now. Just do it right now. Do, get it all done. Uh, whether it's a central leader on apples and pears or that open, open form of, of, of plums and cherries and, and, and apricots and, and peaches, prune them all now. And when you're all done, you're going to spray down. I spray down the entire yard, but especially your fruit trees, you want to spray with horticultural oil. So important. This, I think this year it's really going to be important. When you get done with all of your pruning, I buy the biggest bottle, like a quart-sized bottle of horticultural oil, and here's the reason why. It kills off any eggs that were laid last fall. It kills any wintering over, wintering uh, insects. Like you'll see when you're pruning things, you'll see flies and aphids and thrip, and you'll see things in that leaf litter down below. You'll actually, I'm seeing aphids on my pansies right now. So they're, they're, it's been warm enough. They're active. It's been so mild this year. I think the bugs will be bad this year. So you, as, as listeners, you've tuned in. Here's the insider tip. Take that oil. I put a hose in sprayer and I hose down the entire yard because I want to start fresh. The neighbors can have aphids and thrip and ciliads and all these other horrible insects. Go ahead, deal with that yourself. I'm, I'm going to start out clean myself so I don't have any eggs or any wintering. They can fly in at me, but you're not going to come back from the ground or that leaf litter in my yard and come back and, and rehaunt me. I'm going after you right now. So that's, that's important. Very inexpensive, organic, very safe. The safest you can have for your pets and yourself is horticultural oil. If you got more questions on that, come talk to us and we'll walk you right through it. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Not everyone can grow wildflowers, but we'll make sure you're not one of them. At Waters, we know which wildflowers sprout, thrive, and bloom with success. We're wild about wildflowers with many of our own Arizona blends. Like our Arizona native mix, butterfly and hummingbird mixes, and all are big, bold, and beautiful. At Waters, we know wildflowers, and winter's a season to spread new seed. Waters Garden Center, where people who love their flowers wild, they love to shop for seed. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane. And in this segment, they're just, there's too many men on the radio with garden shows. And so <laughs> I'm glad to qualify that. We just, I wanted this to be more than just a bunch of guys and they're ranting and raving about their tomatoes and their lawn. I think there's some true value at having a woman, woman's perspective, especially when it comes to fragrance and color and style and, and containers and that front entrance and patios and decks. And, and Lisa has that perspective. So she's been, she grew up in the garden center and she has some true value when it comes to de, uh, design and, and, uh, some, some advice 
from a warm woman's perspective. So just mm-hmm. to get rid of all the testosterone, it's all you, my dear. <laughs> we're, we're interested, and I'm here with you. Oh, okay. No pressure. Well, what's the pressure? <laughs> How do you intro your your, your best friend on the radio? Oh, well, thanks, dear. That's very nice. Uh-huh. Anyways. Yeah. I was going to say how you knew there's too many men, men on the radio in I garden stuff. I can't think of one female that does gardening. No, I think they you do might be cooking. Right. They quickly go to cooking or something. Recipe. Even Martha's gone. Martha kind of yeah, a little bit, but it's cook. It's recipe, recipe, recipe. Here's a garden thing. Uh, right. You got Rachel Ray. She was all gardening, and she just went all uh, kitchen stuff because that's mm-hmm. where the money is. So, <laughs> okay, there's a lot more foodies than gardeners, but still, this is a garden program. The gardeners sure. are tuned in. Yeah. I think it's good to get that. We'll turn you into the next Rachel Ray. That's okay. You got the looks. Um, you got the style. Aww, you got the... Aren't you sweet? Mm-hmm. I'm happy with where I am, dear. Okay. I'm happy being here with you. <laughs> So what do we got? So what I thought we should talk about, because it's getting very close to that time of year, um, all that spring stuff pretty soon is, well, it's going to be showing up at the garden centers, but it's also going to be eventually starting to bloom out in the yard. Yeah. But there are so many, I'm really big into that forest season. You should have four different seasons that show up in your landscape. I just think that is so important. And spring bloomers are one of those terrific ones because it, I just love that excitement of watching the forsythia bloom yeah. or the lilacs put out their buds. So I thought we should talk a little bit about those spring plants that people should have in their yard uh, that really just scream spring is here. And ideally, you should put those in the ground before they bloom. A lot of folks come in, they see the color. Mm-hmm. They come and go, I want one of those too. And it's in bloom here, and it's glorious, and it's easy to sell them as a garden center. But but uh, it'd be better if you could put them in the ground and they wake up in your yard so you don't have any transplant shock. Right. They just are, they, they migrate right, they just transition right in your own gardens. Mm-hmm. They wake up going, what just happened? I went to bed over here, and I came up in this yard. What's going on? I guess I'll just bloom here. Mm-hmm. And so the, the, the lilacs start to bloom. If you take it home when it's in bloom, you'll, first of all, you'll blow some of the blooms off as you take it home. And then when you plant it, it goes, no, I don't know about this. This isn't, this isn't what I'm used to. And so they'll shed some, some blossoms. Mm-hmm. It doesn't kill them. It just, they're, they're adapting. Right. So I, I think this is valuable to, oh, to, to great, share. Great time to be planting them because they're still dormant. And you're right. They wake up in your yard and you get to enjoy the That's blossoms true. this yeah, year. Very much. Yeah. So what kind of plants are on their way or here? I noticed the mm-hmm. red, the uh, red twig dogwoods are still, Stunning out there. Oh, viburnums are yeah. budding up like crazy. I know. Crazy, so. yeah. Well, the first plant I want to talk about is the heath. Now, it is actually in bloom right now, but what a terrific plant for the yard for early, early spring color and even gives you winter color. Yeah. Uh, so the heath gets about three foot tall, knee high, something yeah. like that. Uh, it comes in a dark, dark pink, a light pink, and a white. Uh, terrific in those perennial beds, um, grows in pots, containers very well. But it's it's just fabulous right now because it's showing color when there is nothing else in color. <laughs> now, I think that plant is understated. Oh, yeah. We've had that in a container in Prescott Valley, our first house out there, mm-hmm. in a container on the patio exposed to the, to the ranch land. Did great. Mm-hmm. We had it in Skull Valley. And it was right there where the javelina and the elk were roaming through. That's at 4,000 foot. So right. I know it would do well in the Camp Verde, Cottonwood, those areas. Mm-hmm. And then it does obviously well here in the Prescott, this this five 6,000 foot level. So, right. yeah, it's been in bloom and it will continue. It stays in bloom. bloom a long, long yeah. time. So it's really a good plant. Uh, I think it's a good one to mix into the yards. And then, of course, the one that announces kind of spring is forsythia. Um, so for Scythia bloom yellow, I mean, they'll just be full on yellow, golden yellow, yeah. and then they put their leaves on later. So they mix nicely into your landscape where you have trees and shrubs, uh, but it gives you that early shot of color. Uh, the sh- for Scythia we get usually is showtime, um, which is what, about four foot? Yeah, it's a, it's a dwarf, so it mm-hmm. stays about hip high, maybe a little bit higher, easy to keep down to three, four mm-hmm. foot level, easy. 
And for Sith, they are also very animal resistant. That's right. Yeah. So nice. And I, I wouldn't put them as gold. I would I would say not yellow. They're gold. gold. I mean, they are deep, rich. I mean, like that first sunrise of, of the Garden of Eden. It's it's that color of gold. It it's is spectacular uh, gold. And it's it doesn't put a leaf on it. Blooms. Then it gets to bloom. Then it puts its leaves on. So it's a mm-hmm. pure gold. You're always so good. You're such a wordsmith, dear. Well, I also write. You gotta. It's hard to entertain people <laughs> with just words. You, you're given 500 words in a garden article. How do you ex- describe uh, this? It gets the mind, theater yeah. of the mind going. So you no, just play with great. words long enough. I say it's yellow. You're like it's a golden sunset. Well, yellow can be like butter. You're right. And it's can be much muted. prettier than just yeah, yeah. It's a bright gold for those folks from Southern Cal or Phoenix. They don't know mm-hmm. what Forsythia is. Right. Got to describe this. It does so well up here. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful plant. Then, of course, our lilacs. Yeah. And lilacs do tremendous here. Uh, a lot of people, for some reason, they get it in their head that we can't grow lilacs in this area. I don't know why. It's a drought-hardy plant. It's got every. It's on every resistive list for mm-hmm. javelina and rabbits. And right. it, it's just a great plant. For, there's some spectacular specimens around town, mm-hmm. all throughout all the mountains. It does really well. Definitely can get pretty good size. The That's majority true. of them can get pretty good size. Yeah. And there's whites, there's lavenders, there's dark purples. Red, um, the sensation. Red. Variegated. Yes. Uh, yes, it yeah. has that white around it. So a lot of different type of lilacs you can put out there. Um, they've also come out with the smaller bloomerang which is an excellent one for here because it gets about three by three as well, yeah. maybe a little bit bigger four. Um, but it's a repeat blooming lilac, which you just don't see very often. Thus the name Bloomerang. So repeat <laughs> blow over and over, comes back and does it again. Yeah. Right. So that's another great one to put into those perennial beds um, where you just need something smaller, but you like that concept of the, of the lilac on it. We had Bloomerang next to our path of stairs going down to the back we had uh, uh, raised bed kind of gardens next to the steps, these big mm-hmm. steps. We put a bloomerang there because a big lilac would just overpower the whole thing. This is just a cute thing. It's it's maybe four years old. It's maybe just below hip high. It bloomed three times last year. Right. It and same fragrance, a little mm-hmm. bit smaller flower, but, but but amazing. Yeah. Amazing plant. Really is a nice one they've developed. And then also we have the um, azaleas and rhododendrons will be coming in and blooming in spring as well. A lot of that's another one people go, You can grow those here? Well, yeah, they need a little extra help or specific location, kind of a shady side, east side. But yeah, they do tremendous here. You know, I find they do really well under the palm trees or palm Palm pine trees. We have palm trees. I I was thinking, (laughs) I want a palm tree. Yeah, and that's great. Uh, under under the pine trees, yeah. uh, they they love that acidity mm. and they love that filtered sun. It's amazing yeah. how much sun they'll take. True. Or the east side or north side of a tree or shrub mm-hmm. or house or, or let's say in Presque Valley or, or the lower elevations. I would say they would grow even in in the lower as low as four thousand. You know, really? Sedona's, the, the Camp Verdes, the the, hmm. the Kingmans. They would grow there as long as you keep them out of the wind. And you yeah. give them that protection. So you got to put them on that northeast side. That's mm-hmm. protected. Uh, they seem to do really well, and they're evergreen. Right. So they do great here. Mm-hmm. The other thing we'll be getting in very soon is hellebores, which is a hideous name. Yeah. Whoever How came up Linton with that Linton Rose, <laughs> more better common name. Linton Rose sounds so much nicer. <laughs> uh, but it's a great little perennial plant, about 18 inches, two feet tall. They're, again, kind of a shadier filtered light spot, but very unique blooms on these plants. Um, you can get an, almost a black bloom, a cream colored, but definitely check them out if you haven't grown those before. Are those coming in on that truck that's going to yes. be here th- this week? So mm-hmm. I think Wednesday or Thursday, it's supposed to be Probably a Thursday, yeah. full on. I mean, just they, if you want first pickings, yep. don't come Thursday because we'll be over tired and overwhelmed. But come <laughs> Friday, you got first pickings. Right. So network next weekend. Good. Thank you, Lisa. For uh, uh, Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners, thanks for all the great insider tips on spring blooming plants. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. As the days get longer and brighter, houseplants can struggle and scorch, but we have the solution. 
At Waters, we've organized our house plans from A to Z for the brightest of sunny locations, many even bloom. With experts that know plants and how to make them grow. Shipments of the freshest house plants in town have just arrived from A to Z and ready for a bright new home. Waters Garden Center, where people who love bright green house plants, they love to shop, found in Prescott. Now, I had mentioned that uh, wildflowers, it's time to put wildflowers into the ground or on top of the ground. And this is a tremendous area. The mountains of Arizona, we, we grow some of the nicest. We're famous for our wildflowers. They just do so well. From California poppy to Indian paintbrush, coreopsis, galardias, there are so many varieties. And once you get your wildflowers started, they, they repeat they recede and they come back bigger and bigger and larger and spread. They're just just a good way to go. If you've got some larger properties and maybe that woodland meadow area or uh, a, a, a dry wash uh, where you've got uh, some soil kind of where you can put some seed down, this is your time. I would say now, the, the, by the end of this month, February, you want to be have all your wallflowers down. And, and I want to share with not so much the seed varieties, but how to spot good seed quality and then how to put it down without the birds taking it on. It's just some real quick steps. Now, I've, I've got a handout here of, of here's how to grow wildflowers. Okay? It, it's, it, if you want a copy, it's, they're free. They're here at the garden center. Come in and ask for a wildflower handout. It shows you exactly these steps with pictures to go with it. Uh, but, but in a nutshell, here's how you do it. You, you do not, let me go over the mistake. Don't just buy some seed and chuck it on the ground. You won't be successful. You'll be, you'll just be, you'll think you're the worst gardener ever. It's because our soil is hard and the birds are, have a ferocious appetite and pack rats and voles and everything else. So we want to take a few steps to ensure that we have as high a germination rate as possible on that wildflower mix. That, and watch what type of mix you're buying. There are so many knockoffs, cheats, I mean, just shortcuts with wildflowers. It drives me crazy. I'm just, I'm insulted as, as a nursery owner, a gardener, horticulturalist on, on, on the seed mixes I see in the market. It, here's one thing I can tell you, the prettier the package, the less likely you've got a good seed mix. And so there, there are a lot of those pretty canisters and big uh, uh, cellophane type of, of, of mixes, they're all filler. They'll take vermiculite, add a little bit of annual uh, Mexican poppy seed in there, and they'll charge $5.99 for it and go, hey, great value, covers 200 square feet. Going, that's just an annual. It's only going to grow for this year and not come back for you. That's not what I want for you. That's not what you want out in your garden. You want something that comes up, establishes roots, seeds, spreads the seed, and then will come back from the same root, a perennial. Remember, perennial and permanent both start with P. And so those are the kinds of uh, plants you want in your wildflower mix. And you don't want a pure mix. You want a a, a mixture. You want just, you don't want a monoculture. You want a blend of different types of seeds because not every year do the California poppies are, are, are the best showing flowers. Sometimes it's a salvia. Sometimes it's a galardia. Sometimes it's a coreopsis. And so each year varies a bit. And so you want to have a mixture in there. And so you've got different mixes. I, I personally really like beauty beyond belief. It's a little guy out of the, the Colorado area that goes out and 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 he <laughs> hand collects wild seeds. That's a good seed mix. That's perfect. That's those, those are for hours. He's the only guy that's got some blue grama, uh, buffalo, paintbrush, some true nativey type of of grasses and flowers that are unique to us. Then that those kinds of seed you can actually make a meadow. I really like a wild grass and wild flower blend. So I get to, I don't want to mow it. I just want it to be a low maintenance, easy care, wild meadow thing that blooms for me. That's perfect uh, for so, for some gardens. Some of you just want just flowers, nothing but flowers. And so what you'll find is they've got different mixes that are, some are just for butterflies, deer resistive, 
drought hardy. I only want, I don't want the prettiest. I want the toughest. And so they've got a mix of that. They've got somewhere you've got, they've got an Arizona mix we've put together just for us, our flowers. There's a Rocky Mountain mix. It's beautiful. If you can give it a little bit more care, if it's close where it's by some of your gardens, you can water it every once in a while. Oh, stunning, huge, glorious, fragrant flowers in the Rocky Mountain mix. So pick the mix that's right for you. And then what I do is I'll go, I like purples. So my, my thing this year is going to be purple. And so I'm going to try to have more purple hues in, 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 my, in my gardens. And so I'll get a few say, uh, cone flowers. I'll get some, some pure seed that are just purple, or maybe you just like red or purple or pink or, or yellow. And then I'll, I'll customize my mix by taking a few, let's say gold or, or orange poppies. And I'll kind of blend some of those together. So I'm creating my own mix. And then, then I spread that in the yard before you spread it though, do two things. One, Take a stiff tine rake and, and, and rake off the debris in that area where you want the seed, where the seed will be lighting, where, where, where you're going to spread the seed. You want to get rid of the rocks, get rid of the roots and debris, and it opens up the earth so it receives that soil better. Should be pretty easy right now because the, the ground has been heaving or, or expanding, you know, uh, uh, freezing, thawing, freezing, thawing. It creates this fluffy, almost sponge-like effect on the soils, we call it heaving is the actual name of it, but it makes it easier to pull out some of that debris and open up the earth. That's why you're doing it. That's why you're putting wildflower seed down now. Rake that off. And then I don't just spread my seeds. Some of these seeds are small, so small, you can't see them. And so what I'll do is I'll take a bag of mulch, uh, just the uh, water's premium mulch. I'll put it, I'll dump that into a wheelbarrow I'll put my seed on top of that. Actually, I put the seed and the fertilizer all together in the same mix. I'll blend that all together in my wheelbarrow, and then I'll spread that mix. It does two things. It does three things. It makes it easier for me to see where it's spreading. Second, it keeps the birds off because now it's hiding the seed in this mulch pile. And then third, it, it, it increases germination rate because I'll get better soil-to-seed contact by blending it in with, with some composted mulch at the same time. With that, spread it and pray for snow, pray for rain. It just I would say water it every 10, 14 days or so. Don't overdo it. It's easy. These are wild flowers. They're our seed that grow wild natively out in the landscapes, in, in, the, in the mountains. And so spread that out. The key thing is just keep the birds off of it. And then as it germinates, uh, keep it halfway moist. Uh, and then one thing to really watch, I've had this happen so many times. I've heard this. I had a nickel for every time I heard this. My wildflower started coming up and my gardener or my landscaper, or my maintenance person came in and weed whacked them or sprayed them with some killer. And now they're gone. And so as wildflowers first emerge from the ground, they look not like a weed. They look like a plant that, that they don't look like a flower. They don't come out blooming. They got to form their plant first, and then they put the, the flower on them. Secondly, some folks lose their heads because they put the wildflowers out, and they're going, I expected it all to come up at the same time, I've, all of it all at once. That's not how wildflowers works. Some of them are spring bloomers. They come out very early. They like cooler soil. Some are summer bloomers. They want the soil to be warm. And so what you'll find is these wildflowers will come up in waves. Not every seed will germinate all at once. They'll come up at different patterns. All the Coreopsis will bloom, will come up and emerge at the same time. But then the Gallardias will be after that. And then the wild sunflowers will be after that. And then the Pinsamans will be after that. So you see this progression of different types of flowers germinating at, at, at different, you know, several days apart from each other. Don't lose your head. Enjoy the magic that is seed. It's uniquely wildflowers. So water them sporadically. Usually what I'll do is I'll take a soaker hose and I just sling it through there, S through it, through that garden area. And so it makes it easy to water those as I need to. I'll leave this. I'll actually put the wildflower down. I'll, I'll, put my soaker hose on top of that. And I just keep the soaker hose there until I know that they're established and going on their own. Uh, sometimes I flush it there and I flush it there for years. When the wildflowers finally, finally come up, you don't even see the hose. They're just so glorious. Also, one last tip. Wildflowers actually become better 
the longer they're in. First year, they'll bloom. Second year, they bloom really well. The third year, they are amazing and multiply from there. So be patient. This is a magical thing to watch wildflowers coming up from the earth. Again, if you got questions, come talk to us. We want to handhold you through this so you're successful with wildflowers in your own yard. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Let's talk poop. Hey, I'm Tommy at Waters Garden Center. Ken and Lisa are out right now, so I snuck in to remind you that it's time to add some manure to your garden. It's been a wet winter, and your soil is, well, pooped. Waters Barnyard Manure adds nutrients to get your garden growing. It's organic and odorless, so we really can say our poop don't stink. Buy six bags or more. They're only $5.99. Now that's a load of crap. Tommy, what's going on? Oh, poop, gotta go. Natural, safe, odorless, and organic at Waters Garden Center. So spring is right around the corner where I'm starting to see the first things blooming now. So as you see bulbs come up out of the ground, daffodils, and crocus, and tulips, don't stress it. They like this time of year. Don't worry if we get a snowstorm, and I hope we do, your daffodils are going to be six, eight, ten inches tall. Maybe not quite in bloom, but you'll see the green stems coming up. Uh, Iris will do the same. There's a whole series of, of early spring bloomers. These things that, that, that open up this time of year, they like it. They, they love this. So I don't think you have to protect them. I don't think you have to cover them. I think they're just happy with the warm soil and the bright sunshine. Uh, I, I would say be careful of, let's say you just bought a brand new pansy basket and we've got a cold storm coming through. There I might take it and tuck it underneath the overhang of the front you know, patio or deck or something, but I don't, I don't bring it indoors. I don't cover it. Things that have been blooming out there for a while. I don't worry about those things. It's just the brand new things that say they just came out of a greenhouse or just new to the area. And they're still acclimating to your garden for, for a week or two. Then I might protect those, but otherwise I don't worry about it. Uh, a customer just bought some, uh, pink blooming Heath and, and I think an evergreen for the front front door. They're going, Oh, sh- should I, should I wait to plant these or should I go ahead and put them in the ground? They're just, they're asking whether I should, whether the cold is going to hurt them. I'm going, no, they're sitting right out here in the nursery. We purposely leave them exposed so they can acclimate to our climate. So they wake up when all the other spruce and pine, when all the other uh, tree maples, when all the other aspens, when all the other, whatever it is, they'll wake up when all the others wake up. We purposely are not heating the greenhouses. So we force those plants to get used to the cold quickly. And so I think it's okay to plant now. In fact, we've, we've had several, we've had two trucks already delivering plants already, and we're acclimating those. We've got the first really big load of plants. This is when the, the lilacs, forsythias, the spring blooming plants will be in this week. And so it'll be the end of this week, and we will be full on, I mean, just plants everywhere. And it will be a full truck from there. I think the week after that, it's spruce and pine are, are loading by, I don't know about the hundreds, but definitely the dozens and dozens and dozens. These are big. If you want a big spruce, pine, fir, cypress, cedar, juniper, that'll be the week after. And so it's starting. It's okay to plant those and just leave them out there. They're used to the cold. They're used to, they're a landscape plant that's going to have to learn to grow out there. And we are purposely acclimating those so you can take them home and put them in the ground. I, I sense my, my desert folks or Southern California folks, they just seem tentative. It's like they don't know what to do if it's under 80 degrees. These plants like that. They're okay with it. So I, I, under, I understand you're pre, you want to baby them and treat them like little puppy dogs, but, but you don't have to. Uh, garden classes this week. We've got Grant Tibbetts from Johnny's Tree Service teaching my folks how to prune. I thought bring in the one of the best arborists, true certified arborists, is going to teach a class this week on on how to prune. After that, we've got uh, we just had Laura do wildflowers. Got a whole series of different. Uh, uh, the week after that, we've got uh, what is that? February tenth, I think, is next week. Controlling gophers and annoying animals. That's usually my forte, so I'll probably teach that class. Gardening for newcomers. If you're new to the area, 
February 17th coming up. Take a look at the entire class schedule at watersonline.com. Again, they're free. They're meant to help be a, a good resource for you. Again, our, our niche, Waters Garden Center, my what I, what's made our family famous in the local area gardening-wise is we're a content. We, we help people garden. So if you want information, we're the place. If you want to know what a bug is, a weed is, a plant it, we're the place. That's been our success, too. That's how this scrappy little garden center in Prescott takes on the behemoths of the, the marts and the, the boxes and succeeds by helping folks garden smarter and better. If you do that, we find that people come back and they want to do it with you again. And so they, they feel this connection. So support us in that way and come and just enjoy hanging out with other gardeners at a garden class every Saturday at 930. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Let's talk poop. Hey, I'm Tommy at Waters Garden Center. Ken and Lisa are out right now, so I snuck in to remind you that it's time to add some manure to your garden. It's been a wet winter, and your soil is, well, pooped. Waters Barnyard Manure adds nutrients to get your garden growing. It's organic and orderless, so we really can say our poop don't stink. Buy six bags or more. They're only $5.99. Now that's a load of crap. Tommy, what's going on? Oh, poop, gotta go. Natural, safe, odorless, and organic at Waters Garden Center. Ouch! Oh man, another rock! Hi, I'm Rusty. You know, the shovel you're destroying trying to dig that hole? Sure, I get it. We got these beautiful plants at Waters Garden Center. Waters asked if they could plant them for you, but no. You had to do it yourself, even though they would plant, deliver, and guarantee your plants for two years. I hope I don't end up like that old pickaxe. Ouch! Prevent yard tool abuse. Waters Garden Center. They plant, deliver, and guarantee. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.